Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Network 2020's briefing about Russia's inner workings. I am Courtney Doggard. I'm the president of Network 2020. Um, it is a pleasure to have uh, three wonderful panelists here today. We're going to talk a lot about um, inside, because during these past few months, a lot of attention has rightly focused on Russian President Vladimir Putin, who he is, how his physical and mental health is, what his aims are. And while he undoubtedly is a very important person to study right now, he does not operate in a vacuum, despite sitting at the far end of a table. Um, mm -hmm. And so understanding the levers that are shaping his environment and the, and the calculations that he's making are really important. Um, and so for that reason, we are delighted to have three top-notch experts walk us through what some of those levers are. Before I introduce them, though, I just wanted to say a few words about Network 2020 for those who might be joining us for the first time. We are an inclusive international community, and we're dedicated to bringing greater insights and relations to a global audience. So we run a number of programs. Um, many of these discussions are available on our YouTube channel, so we do encourage you to subscribe. And now to meet our panelists. Um, first, we have Stanislav Budnitsky, and he is a scholar of Russian media politics at the Russian and East European Institute at Indiana University Bloomington and the Center for Global Cooperation Research at the University of Duisburg Essen. Um, so welcome Stanislav, he will really help us walk through the media context. Uh, next we have Anna, oh nope, next we have Timothy Fry, apologies, um, who is the Marshall Shulman Professor of Post-Soviet Foreign Policy at Columbia University. Um, and he really focuses on comparative politics and political economy in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Um, so welcome. And last but not least, we have Anna Orhanian, who is the Richard B. Finnegan Distinguished Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stonehill College. She is also a non-resident senior scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Russia and Eurasia program, and a two-time Fulbright Scholar to the South Caucasus. So welcome, Anna, all for being here today. <laughs> Um, and I hope I don't mind you that I call you by your first names. We're pretty informal here. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Tim, Tim, is it Tim or Timothy? Tim is fine. Tim, Tim is very fine. Okay. Yeah. Tim is fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so just to start with your 2017 uh, book, which is Weak Strongman, The Limits of Power in Putin's Russia, you analyze the different pressures that Putin needs to balance out in order to stay in power. So would you mind just walking us through um, who Putin is depending on, who those different groups are? Sure. Uh, there's a common view that uh, because Vladimir Putin is politically unchallenged, particularly now with his main rival, Alexei Navalny, behind bars, uh, that he's omnipotent and can just do whatever he wants. But remember, he governs uh, a country that stretches 11 time zones of more than 140 million people. Uh, it's largely urban, relatively well-educated. Uh, and in order for him to get people to do things, he sometimes needs to bribe them, sometimes needs to persuade them, sometimes uh, needs to use coercion and repression. And uh, 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 he faces two challenges that all autocrats face, which is the fear of being overthrown by someone from their inner circle, which is a common way that autocrats lose power, or being thrown, overthrown by a mass revolt. And the problem for autocrats like Putin is that you can't rarely address uh, both of these threats at the same time. For example, if we look at uh, how Putin uses corruption, certainly the inner circle has grown rich off corruption, but Putin cannot allow so much corruption that the economy collapses and people take to the streets. So Putin has to balance these two competing threats. And the war in some ways has made this balancing act more difficult in that the size of the pie is expected to fall by about 10% uh, in the coming year. And his ability to buy the support of the mass public and those with his, within his inner circle will be challenged by uh, the uh, you know, lack of resources. And he also did not do a great job of preparing the elites and the masses uh, for this campaign. It came as a surprise to most. So they're really building the narrative used to sell the war on the fly. Now, 
This doesn't mean he's going to lose power uh, uh, tomorrow or anytime soon. Autocrats have weathered worse. Putin's been around a long time. He's very cagey. But the way he governs will have to change, and it will be more difficult to balance these two competing threats going forward. One quick question that. Um, you mentioned how... Uh, because of this campaign, the size of that pie is shrinking. Um, but of course, all the reports we heard were that was that he was anticipating a very quick campaign. Um, was that to serve any purpose of either feeding either of those um, two different levers that, that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, to my mind, um, you know, public opinion before the war was not very supportive of uh, the idea that Russia and Ukraine were uh, destined to be one country. 80% uh, of Russians were perfectly fine with a sovereign Ukraine, and only 20% of Russians preferred uh, a unified Russia and Ukraine. Uh, in, in addition, uh, past research had shown that Russian public is fairly sensitive to body counts. So um, in uh, Eastern Ukraine and Georgia and in Syria, the way that the war was conducted was to try to limit casualties. And a lightning strike on Kiev would be one way to try to limit uh, casualties. So in that sense, you know, Putin, I think, was taking into account that uh, uh, if the war turned into a long slog, that this could potentially be a problem with uh, Russian public opinion. I do think that that helped to guide his strategy. The other issue is that he surrounded himself with people who are reluctant to give him hard truths. And I'm sure that uh, he was given overly rosy pictures of what would happen in Ukraine and how effective the Russian forces would be. Great. Th thank you for that. Um, Anna, turning to you, you wrote a lot about Russia's neighborhood policy um, and its regionalism attempts uh, within its security orbit. So how important is it for the Russian regime's self-perception to be that dominant influence in the region? Um, sure, I think self-perception is an important word here because uh, for so long, I think the dominant discourse on Russia has been emphasizing uh, material capacities uh, inside Russia, its resources, resource endowments, institutional systems, which matter greatly. Uh, but the much uh, smaller literature has been talking about the perception of an image, of a status perception inside Russia. And that social competition with the West has very much driving Russia's Kremlin's relation um, uh, relative to the West, and not only uh, under President Putin, but also historically. Stephen Kotkin actually has a very good article on this perpetual geopolitics that explains us to how Russia historically uh, always punches above its weight, even though lacking in terms of uh, looking for geopolitical, getting stuck in geopolitical competition while lacking the resources. But in terms of the regional dimension, I want to highlight a very specific development on regional policy over the past two decades, um, and which is that, uh, and I have to argue that in the West, we kind of, um, the policymakers forget that Russia's global policy is very much made in the regions, meaning that um, Russia has used its regional policies, unresolved armed conflicts in the post-Soviet states, uh, authoritarianism in these regions as a way to project power globally. The creation of regional organizations, CSTO, for example, has been very much a tool in order to remain a broker in these regions and try to be an intermediator to connect these regions to the global level of power projections. But what is very specific with the Russian invasion in Ukraine is that Russia's approach to its regions and globally might be shifting and not to the advantage of the Kremlin, um, I would argue. Up until now, Russia at least um, uh, at least had a facade that it wants to be this one of the not in this emerging multipolarity and that it was working with China in pushing for greater connectivity in Eurasia. And as such, 
to the regions, it was becoming uh, uh, offering itself as a broker, as an interlocutor to help the smaller states um, in, in, uh, in integrating with the greater Eurasia. But oh, and that was a value that Russia did have for China, which is interested in strategic connectivity. With the war in Ukraine, uh, this model is very much uh, weakened, uh, to put it mildly. Um, but I think the Russia's uh, and the, uh, the war in Ukraine is very much a manifestation of this fact that geopolitical rivalry between Russia and the West. Is, uh, is a huge liability for state building processes, democratization processes in the states. And perhaps we could talk about it later on, uh, but I think while Russia uh, appears very strong, at the same time, Russia takes advantage of the blind spots from the Western policies, uh, whether it's not leaning in on building, institutionalizing peace building processes, in some of the post-Soviet wars, providing minority protections, um, privileging sustained commitment to democratic institution building. It is these gaps that have allowed Russia to fill and elevate and punch above its weight. Thank you. That, that, that's, that, that's an excellent overview. And I think we, we should definitely dig into, um, into that point about the, those gaps later on. Uh, for sure, thank you. Um, Stanislav, you've tracked changes in the Russian media landscape since the start of the invasion and also before. Um, so how how did you see Russia preparing its own population for, for this attack? And um, how do you see public opinion in Russia forming these days? Thank you, yeah. So um, I suggest that we go back not two months, but 10 years uh, in Russia's kind of media landscape history to understand what's happening. I'll try to pack it in the next four or five minutes. Um, so I want to focus broadly on, on two developments, first to do with the television, the other to do with the internet. Um, and so starting in 2012, when Putin returned to his third presidential, presidential term, we see um, a drastic shift, um, obviously the, you know, kind of the much more liberal turn, as we all know, much more a neoconservative turn, but as part of the turn, uh, a shift in media strategy. Um, and the strategy was twofold, we can say. So um, by 2012, it's been already uh, a decade that the television, the mainstream television had been under state control, but the social, con con the social contract uh, between the state and the society in the 2000s was that the state doesn't get in your private business, uh, the people don't get in the, you know, into politics basically. And so the dominant narratives on television and the dominant mode of kind of televised programming was basically feel good infotainment or entertainment. You know, the whole point was to depoliticize the population. Now, starting in 2012, we see a radical shift in that uh, toward uh, what some scholars have called agitainment. So a combination of agitation and entertainment or infotainment. And so a good example of that is these nightly shows that start appearing on every single channel and run for hours. Um, that focused primarily on Ukraine, the United States, uh, you know, Russia is a besieged fortress. And that in terms of their format combine um, kind of a, let's think of a CNN panel of experts of six to eight experts combined with the trashes, you know, daytime television where people, you know, punch each other, scream at each other, kick each other out, out of the studio, which literally happens regularly when uh, the host would uh, punch and kick out their, uh, their guests from the studio in the shows. And so, this constant agitation has been happening for the past 10 years. It has been happening in the lead up to the 2014 events and then for the following eight years. And uh, another major development after 2012 it is the turn toward much more hands-on approach to um, internet governance or regulation, because up to 2012, this was kind of uh, considered a, an alternative public sphere, if you will, uh, kind of a sandbox where the state said, okay, you go and play and you know, discuss and criticize us in this little sandbox that doesn't matter. Uh, now, the, the anti-governmental rallies of 2011, 2012, the largest one in Russian post-Soviet history, uh, I'm not suggesting they were caused by the internet, but the internet certainly facilitated or helped um, uh, those protests. So at least the perception of the internet uh, in the Kremlin uh, shifted toward a much more serious attitude toward it. And so after 2012, for the first time, you see uh, a much more hands-on approach. So you see a regulatory framework, infrastructural uh, um, innovations, new policies um, and laws meant to basically uh, 
gradually step by step limit um, the space for that criticism for free expression or create a chilling effect. Um, you see political economic measures. So for example, basically they've taken over the ownership of online critical resources, just ousting their editorial teams or owners. Um, you see blacklist laws that kind of under the guise of fighting child pornography or terrorism, uh, blacklist oppositional media. Uh, and various kind of restrictive laws and policies that that step by step year by year delimit the space um, more immediately in the lead up to these so that's kind of the general context that's been happening for the past 10 years and 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 kind of tighter and tighter the space has been getting tighter and tighter and in the immediate weeks uh, preceding the the invasion uh, and some colleagues of ours have done this kind of ad hoc content analysis and it shows that, for example, the key words of this you know, of this war, of this invasion, or the pre for the pretext for this invasion. So, for example, genocide, they spike literally days or weeks before the invasion. You know, so the suggestion is that the genocide has been happening for eight years, but somehow it's only it's not been in part of the discussion, part of the narrative for eight years. But in the lead up, in the literal lead up, in the days and weeks following it, in the first uh, weeks following the the invasion, uh, this invasion, the two thousand. 22 one, you see a spike in, in mentions of the, the, those breakaway republics and mentions of genocides and all of these key, uh, key words meant to, again, agitate the population and form the public opinion. Now, the last thing I want to say about the public opinion, it has been one of the most, I guess, contentious issues because people have tried to poll Russians, you know, whether they support the war or not. And every time a poll comes out, usually show support anywhere between 50 and 80%. And the pun is the academics start debating, can we trust it? You know, it's authoritarian regime, it's wartime. And I think the, um, the burden of proof that it is not popular should be, or the burden of proof should be on those who are suggesting that it's not popular. Because I personally don't see any um, prior um, kind of evidence to suggest that it's not. Now we may debate whether it's 50 or 80%, what does that support mean? Are people willing to go and die for it? I think probably not. But I think the we, um, you know, people studying the, the region, they 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 have either they know people who who support it, or or they have uh, you know know the events that preceded it. So I don't believe that the public opinion just flipped overnight, you know, on February twenty fourth to, to you know everyone wanting to um, un overthrow the government and you know being against this war. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a great point. And I think I think in the U.S. too, um, you know, we we drifted away from talking about Ukraine for some time. But I remember being in Russia in 2015, and you know, there's protests outside subway stations about you know helping Ukraine, and um, and you know, people people wanted to know what we were saying about Ukraine in the in the U.S. and just you know, so it's it's really not a topic, um, the the way that it was there. So so thank you for walking us through through that. Um, Tim, turning back to Putin, um, he's often depicted as someone who has lost touch with reality. He's isolated. Um, you know, there there are any number of theories, but um, but you know, particular in terms of his. Um, connection with reality and what's happening on the ground. Would would you support that claim? And how how has his distance to or from reality shifted in the past you know years and decades? Well, in my book, I'm I'm pretty skeptical about trying to reduce Russian politics to Vladimir Putin's personality or his occupational background. Um, he doesn't speak with me. If he did, I'm sure he would, uh, like all politicians, put a spin on it. So uh, I'm pretty skeptical of the notion that he's somehow irrational. Um, look, the US government expected uh, the lightning strike strategy to be effective. I mean, all the military people were saying, you know, if the Ukrainians hold out for a week, uh, that would be, you know, remarkable. So it wasn't a um, you know an implausible move. Uh, you know, it's horrific. It's a crime. I condemn it wholeheartedly. But from a purely military point of view, it's not an un, it was not an unreasonable strategy. It turned out ex post to uh, not have worked. Um, and you know, I just don't know how much we learn by speculating 
about what it means that Putin sometimes sits at tables where he's farther apart from some people and he other times he sits at tables closer to people. It's odd, it's strange, um, uh, you know, uh, how that influences whether or not he's willing to escalate, I think is really just guessing. Um, I think it's important, to, and also I think it, it's potentially dangerous to think that Putin has somehow lost it and is behaving irrationally, particularly given that he has adjusted the strategy domestically in a way that seems reasonable. The plan A seems to have not worked. Now they're moving in a kind of reasonable way to plan B. Um, in domestic politics, there's been a massive crackdown, as we see often during wars. And it you know, doesn't seem to be you know, kind of irrational. You know, I, it's horrible. I, I wish he had, wouldn't do it. But you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily evidence of you know, somebody kind of losing touch with reality. Um, so I, I don't think we should plot our strategy on the assumption that we're dealing with, with a madman, um, uh, given that a lot of his moves seem to be um, understandable taken from you know, his point of view, even if we you know, oppose them. Just, uh, just as a follow-up to that, um, so there's, there's the reality question, which is trying to get into perhaps a mental state, which, which mm -hmm. we rightly shouldn't do. Um, but then there's the, the, the people around him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have heard from a couple of sources that the, the, number, the number of those advisors is shrinking. And so in terms of just the, that, that information space that he's operating in, um, how would you-, how would you yeah, I think that, that's that? the key point. That, and, uh, it's common in these personalist autocracies, that is autocracies run by a single individual, that over time, the uh, number of confidants that the ruler has shrinks. And we've seen that definitely in Putin's case, where in his first you know, two terms in office, he had a fairly diverse set of advisors, um, some of whom had strong liberal views who wanted to see Russia integrated uh, with the West. Over time, particularly after uh, 2012, as Stanislav mentioned, that circle just keeps shrinking over time. And you know, I don't have sources in the Kremlin. People who do tell me that the decision was likely taken in consultation with five or six advisors, many of whom share Putin's deeply anti-Western views. Um, but I should say that Putin's kind of obsession with Ukraine uh, is not something that I think is broadly held, even among his inner circle, even as they are very anti-Western. Uh, it's really Putin himself that has really pushed the narrative that Ukrainians or Russians are one people and that he is writing some kind of historical injustice. So although, you know, I'm often critical of views that, you know, a single individual really matters, I think in this case, it really does. And individual worldviews are more important in foreign policy. Uh, they're more important in autocracies. And I think this is the case where having Putin in power rather than some other hardliner really matters for, you know, what has taken place on the ground. Thank you. Um, Anna, one of the um, other factors that seems to play into things are um, what, again, what's happening in neighboring countries, whether it's EU or NATO expansion in particular, color revolutions, democratization. Um, how do these shifts in neighboring countries play into Russia's mm -hmm. internal logic? Um, overall, I think there's much written by scholars as well as public policy analysts that in general, uh, Putin does feel threatened by, by what he calls street protests, color revolutions in particular, uh, simply but primarily I would argue uh, highlighting that they're driven, he perceives them as to be driven by the West. 
And here, there is certain uh, um, a kernel of truth in terms of that this democratic transition are, where obviously democratic movements in Georgia and Ukraine, two times in, in Ukraine, were driven very much by grassroots movements, but they were heavily geopoliticized by local actors as well as by the Western support. And that really made it much more difficult to not only consolidate democracy in these countries, but it played into this division, um, uh, West and Russia, that made it much harder for this, that seeped into domestic politics that, that made it much harder. So overall, um, uh, Kremlin has been critical and uh, uh, dismissive of the street protests, but at the same time, there are also scholars, and I do share some of the research comments, Luke and Wei, for example, who have been, uh, have been arguing that unless the democratizing countries do a geopolitical jump, Kremlin will not react, meaning that it matters more for the Kremlin that the elites stay within its security orbit and as to whether they have a democratic institutions or not, perhaps matters less. This to me makes more sense simply because it also conforms to uh, the long view of Russia, historical view of Russia. And Russia has a long history, imperial history, actually pre-Soviet history of living with much with peripheries, with its peripheries, imperial peripheries, that were a lot more, that had more representative institutions than uh, Russia itself. In the case of the, the uh, Velvet Revolution in Armenia, as well as attempted revolution in Belarus, um, in the case of Armenia, Russia uh, was constrained, and many have been trying to understand. Russia has bases in Armenia. They could have gone out of the, uh, and essentially got involved, but uh, th that was not what transpired. And in, in the case of Belarus, the movements there, uh, movement leaders also were very smart in presenting this transition uh, uh, as devoid of geopolitical orientation. And we can discuss as to why Belarus movement did not succeed. But overall, I think this is something to pay attention to as we think of Russia down the road, uh, uh, managing, understanding, positioning the Western policies, Western posture relative to local agency in this regions is critical, meaning that uh, geopoliticizing too much puts them fairly squarely on Putin's radar, makes it a lot more personal for Putin. At the same time, I would also argue that as an imperial power, uh, the Kremlin uh, does uh, need elites that are more or less legitimate. Um, in the case, uh, in this level of legitimacy will allow, uh, uh, allows the Kremlin to implement, to have influence over these countries. Um, as that, uh, this, in addition, the second mechanism by which that explains as to why Putin might tolerate open political systems is that nascent democracies are politically open, so they're a lot more vulnerable, they're easier to manipulate. So that's also an incentive, uh, explains as to why Putin might have a hands-off approach. But overall, by uh, putting, by engaging in this regional fracture strategy, creating instability just enough to become relevant, to become the security broker, uh, but not too much, uh, is also a liability for Russia, because Russia, in the case of the South Caucasus, as well as in, uh, in Ukraine uh, and Belarus region, uh, is learning that uh, fermenting this level of instability can backfire, um, and that other players, whether it's Turkey, Iran, China, can take advantage. So it is a double-edged sword, um, but overall, I do think the and uh, Russia's democratization, the strength of Russian state down the road post-Putin, very much depends not directly, but that as to what happens to the state in its into the regions in its peripheries, and state building in these regions need to be uh, uh, appreciated as a strategic value in thinking about the Kremlin, in thinking about Russia. Um, I have uh, written in in, in in few places arguing that uh, uh, U.S. is Russia po Russian policy is too Russian, it's too Kremlin-centric, it's too <laughs> binary. Uh, we have to, Russia does use its peripheries in very specific ways. The Kremlin uses the peripheries very specific ways for its regime security. Um, but the, the, I, I don't think the Western policymakers are thinking about Russia in regional terms.
Great, thank you. That that's fascinating, um, and I and I hope we get back to that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I will go to the Q and A box. So Stanislav, um, you know, we you you talked a lot about how the information landscape has shifted, particularly since 2012, um, and and you know, and in particular, how then there, there was a turn towards uh, looking at the internet. Um, I'd be curious to hear. Um, uh, you know whether or not you've seen the that media landscape changing since the invasion, um, and in particular, are there channels developing that are not state controlled? Because I always find it fascinating when people sort of figure out a way around, um, you know, where where the boundaries have, are drawn or redrawn. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. So I think the, in the past two months, the changes that Russian internet has undergone or its uh, governance have been tremendous. Um, but they all rely on the, you know, the previous 10 years that I've talked about. So all the frameworks, all the infrastructures were there um, and they were just, uh, you know, turned up, you know, the volume was just turned all the way up. So for example, the Russia passed laws that um, allowed it and um, introduced infrastructures that allowed it to block, for example, foreign platforms years ago. Um, the only platform it had actually blocked was LinkedIn, precisely because of its insig like social insignificance. There's not going to be unrest by, you know, white collar uh, IT professionals or someone about LinkedIn, right? But but Facebook and Twitter, even though they have uh, much fewer uh, users than, for example, the Russian-based uh, Russians indigenous uh, platforms. Uh, they they have enough followers to especially YouTube and Instagram to potentially cause some you know uh, disturbance, but they were all nevertheless blocked since the start of this uh, uh, of this war, with the exception of YouTube. Um, so another um, another innovation, if you will, is the implementation, for example, introduction of fake news laws that pertain specifically to this war. But again, Russia already had those fake fake news laws since two thousand nineteen. So again, the, 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 all the infrastructure, all the frameworks, uh, regulatory discursive, they were already in place. So for example, the Facebook was already talked about as this place where you know, the fifth column sort of gathers, uh, kind of the liberal westernized the fifth column gathers. So outside of the people who actually use it, you know, there's not gonna be a wide social dissatisfaction with the decisions. And so uh, that uh, all of the in, all of the um, oppositional or uh, regime critical uh, alternative uh, media outlets have been uh, either blocked or outright shut down completely, just kind of disbanded basically. So that space has shrunk tremendously. So the ten years, so we went basically the path that we went uh, that we have covered in the past ten years. We covered in the past two months. It's been kind of jammed into the past two months. Now, as for what has been done, so the media ecosystem, if you will, has been slowly adjusting to this new reality. For example, people have the use of uh, VPNs has skyrocketed, and we've seen a lot of reports about that. But again, I'm going to be kind of the, the skeptic pessimist here, the, the glass half empty kind of person here, which is that, for example, one uh, internet service provider reported uh, an increase of 60 times uh, of use uh, Six to time increase in the use of VPNs within you know a week or so after the blocking of all those of the Facebook, Instagram, um, and Twitter. Now, what does it amount to? Two and a half percent of their users. That's after the six to time increase. Mm -hmm. Now, also it, we kind of perhaps here you know in the West, let's say we jump to the conclusion: oh, this must be the people seeking information about Ukraine and wanting to fight Putin. No, the absolute majority of them, and we know it from the statistics of internet usage, are going to go to Instagram and post their, I don't know, cats or babies or whatnot, right? So things are changing, but um, they are minuscule to the, compared to the uh, changes that have been imposed by, you know, the Kremlin to kind of stymie and stifle um, what is uh, the, any critical speech and any critical opinions. Another trend, for example, is that uh, those disbanded uh, TV stations, uh, radio stations, newspapers, websites, a lot of their journalists or even their whole uh, editorial teams have relaunched or launched a new their YouTube channel. So for example, a lot of individual uh, popular anchors on certain on a TV channel uh, launch their own YouTube. So you, you would think that it gives kind of a false sense of, of 
plurality. So as an individual, you can now fill your entire day with 24 seven hours of this kind of post podcast like YouTube videos that criticize Putin all day long. But the number of such individuals taken together has shrunk tremendously. Because if you compare, if you add up all of these YouTube channels uh, of this individual, for example, journalist that launched very nicely kind of podcast like shows and compare it to their viewership of the channels that they left or the radio stations that they left, this is, this is minuscule. So it gives this false sense of like, oh, things are getting back. You know, the system is readjusting. We have all these things to watch. But the number of people has shrunk tremendously. So even in this, you know, age where we think, you know, there's the internet, there is access to everything, if only one wishes, um, the state is extremely effective and has all the mechanism as a disposal, both, uh, you know, policy, infrastructure, coercion, um, and people's, you know, laziness. It's, it's, it's annoying to turn your VPN on and off all the time because some services require it, some don't. So over time, again, we know that uh, kind of it, it falls down and plateaus at a fairly uh, low level of the VPN usage. And it's just part of the system, just like in China. The people using VPN in China are just part of the system. Like the state knows that there's people like that. It's not trying to, you know, fight them because it's just part of the kind of the, the, the equilibrium. And there's been also some foreign um, efforts at this time so far. I've seen private. Uh, so in 2014, there's been a lot of uh, talk and, and some action from the state actors to do kind of Cold War era, you know, public diplomacy of to launch new TV stations, new websites that would kind of broadcast uh, information into, into Russia. Um, so far, I've not seen uh, state initiatives, but I've seen some private initiatives. For example, Germany is built, uh, the, the Europe's uh, most mm -hmm. uh, widely circulated paper launched its Russian version. Uh, the uh, a consortium of Scandinavian papers uh, are releasing Russian language coverage of the war on their website so the danish uh, finnish and swedish uh, main uh, main papers but again unfortunately this is this is a drop in the sea so as an individual there's a lot there for you but uh the number of these individuals is um kind of so minuscule that again uh because i've seen a lot of coverage of what do russians know what what media can russians access how can we get the information to russians um, and again, unfortunately, um, I'm afraid that the number of people who actually crave or want or seek this information is, is tremendously low altogether. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to the Q&A box now. And Anna, I'm going to start with you. We have a question here. Um, and they ask, is there any sense of how the Russian speaking residents or ethnic Russians of the Donbass region, at least those who are living there before this war, feel about citizenship in Ukraine? The, uh, I think actually Tim uh, made a reference to this, if I remember, but there is there have been actually surveys done in all the de facto states, um, Donbass, um, Abkhazia, Ossetia, and I believe also in Nagorno-Karabakh. But the uh, the research, one of the participants is Gerald Toll, Gerald, uh, Gerald Toll, and the data that they have been collecting for a while indicated that the population in these regions were not clearly towards inclined towards uniting with the West, nor they were inclined clearly to um, unite with, uh, with Russia. There was significant support for staying, significant group um, share of the respondents indicated um, uh, essentially um, to stay as part of Ukraine. So the version um, uh, that the Russia uh, is there to liberate um, the Russian and uh, that is there to prevent the genocide, I don't think that was substantiated. And I think while there were uh, significant anti-Kiev protests after the Maidan, um, uh, I don't think that would have degenerated into an armed conflict if it was not for Russian intrusion uh, in 2014 with the Crimea annexation. That's number one. And number two, I think over time, Ukrainian state actually improved since the Maidan in terms of integrating and accommodating uh, and really becoming a lot more uh, effective in terms of multi-ethnicity that if time uh, was allowed, I think that's where Ukraine was headed. 
Uh, but still, I think uh, Russia, the Kremlin's talking point was that um, in the Minsk agreements, uh, 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 there was a point for autonomy that the Donbass Republic should receive a special autonomy. Everyone knew that it was a way for Russia to maintain influence over Ukraine by uh, through this uh, autonomous region. But at the same time, you could also argue that all of the conflict uh, literature, uh, ethnic conflict literature points to that over time, ethnic conflicts are resolved with greater accommodation, accommodation of ethnic groups, whether it's autonomy, federalism, democratization. So uh, what was interesting to me at the time that Putin is speaking, quote unquote, a liberal language. <laughs> on, on the one hand, you could say it would be in, in Ukraine's interest to uh, increase its capacities of accommodating, whether it's the Russians in Donetsk Republic or Donetsk Republics in general. Uh, but obviously we do know that there are nefarious uh, intent associated with what Russia uh, was doing. So I, I think, uh, uh, and it's not surprising that R Russia is having an uphill battle in the you know, Donetsk Republics because they, my assessment is that Russia calculated that they would have, that the soldiers would have Russian support uh, Russian, uh, ethnic Russians would join the uh, Russian military, invading military, and that did not transpire. Uh, and which, again, is not surprising because there no, was no overwhelming support for, Don, for Donetsk, uh, for the two republics to join with Russia. That explains as to why Russia did not succeed. Great, thank a, you. Jump in on this. There's a broader point here, too, about um, that we should question the argument that nations and states should be, or ethnic groups and states should all be under one roof, right? If, you know, the diplomat from Kenya at the United Nations made this memorable speech where he pointed out, if we insisted that every state in Africa was rooted in a, a single uh, uh, ethnicity and that ethnicity did not include people from other countries, uh, then Africa would be on fire and fighting all the time. So it's a very 19th century notion of, of citizenship, statehood, and identity. Um, so there, there's even a deeper kind of form of criticism that, uh, um, you know, that we can make against that argument. Fantastic point. Thank you. Um, Tim, staying on you for a little bit, we have a question about whether or not you have in, any information about Alexander Dugan. He's the, um, as you don't know, he's a political philosopher um, uh, who has, I think, quite a bit of influence and the Russian Orthodox uh, yeah. theologians who are influencing him. And so, so and, and just to expand on that too, the role yeah. of the church in general, I think is actually. Yeah, yeah so these, these are really big questions. I've never been a big, fan of the Dugan is Putin's brain uh, argument. Um, Putin reads many things. Um, uh, Dugan is most often cited as influential by Dugan and by the people who interview him. Uh, I guess I would be more um, persuaded if there were uh, you know, other people who, who, who told me about how influential uh, Dugan is. Um, uh, you know, that said, you know, his his worldview increasingly seems to fit, you know, Putin's view. Although even there, you know, I think the Putin's view of Ukraine, I think, is distinct from his view of Kazakhstan or kind of Eurasianism writ large. In that, you know, I don't think he sees, uh, you know, the presence of Russians in Kazakhstan as a historical injustice in the same way that he sees uh, Russian speakers in Ukraine as somehow torn uh, from the, uh, you know, the bosom of Moscow uh, as something that needs to be corrected. So, um, you know, I, I think we wanna draw a distinction between how Putin views Ukraine and how he views the whole of Eurasia, which of course is the, at the heart of Dugin's argument that Russia is destined to be this dominant player culturally, spiritually, materially across this whole, um, this whole great plane. And I don't think we've seen you know, that in the same way uh, from Putin. On the Russian Orthodox Church, I mean, Russia is, is primarily a secular society and the church is less, I mean, 
religion plays less of a role in Russian politics than it does in American politics by any by any stretch. Um, but the church as a symbol of Russian nation of the Russian nation, you know, is still a powerful symbol uh, for for many Russians, particularly those who are more sympathetic towards the Kremlin. I think what we're really seeing the beginnings of is a great fracturing of Russian society between the broadly speaking, those who favor a fortress Russia view rooted in a Russia that is largely turns its back on outside influences, embraces institutions more uh, indigenous to Russia like the Russian Orthodox Church, um, and those who favor a kind of globalized Russia more integrated into, the, uh, into Europe, uh, typically people more willing to uh, search out non-state media. And there's a huge age gradient here with people under 40 being much more skeptical of uh, Putin versus people over 60 who are much more supportive. And I think the war is only gonna drive those two groups uh, 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 further apart. Great, thank you. Um, Stanislav, I have kind of a dual pronged question for you. So, so one person is asking, is there any way to get the message out to Russian soldiers that the fight is not with them, but with Putin? Um, so I guess I communicate to, to these soldiers in Ukraine. Um, and on the flip side of that, um, a lot has been made of um, mothers in Russia and how they're reacting to the deaths of their soldier sons and what they know. Um, and, you know, do, do you see anything interesting happening in, in that sphere? Um, as for the soldiers, I think the only way would be to basically hack the Russian telecoms and, you know, to mass text um, the soldiers, which is not impossible because we've seen a tremendous amount of hacking uh, done on two Russian institutions since the start of the war. There's a, a, a project kind of sort of like WikiLeaks called uh, deny, Distributed Denial of Secrets, which is the kind of this dump of uh, all the hacked uh, materials from, you know, the Russian banks, the Russian TV stations. Um, so a lot of wealth of archival materials for, you know, academics or whoever interested mm -hmm. to go through. So that would be, you know, on a technical level, that would be my only uh, thought. But, but it gets to a more important point and a bigger point about this idea that, you know, if only we get the, the you know, accurate or, you know, truthful or kind of regime critical information to a segment of the Russian population, be it soldiers or the Russian population generally, surely they will, you know, immediately kind of wake up and, and, and turn against Putin. And I, again, I just don't think that's the case. Um, and that's the premise of the many Western efforts, uh, which um, again, I'm not trying to discourage them because the more information, the better. And for those people in Russia seeking that information, it is crucial and critical to have it. But uh, I'm skeptical more of their kind of society-wide um, effect. And, and, and uh, because again, for example, think of all the information we have had on COVID and the vaccines in, in you know, Western democracies where all that information is freely available, but yet we have millions of people you know, denying, you know, we, we well, no, I don't need to go, to go into it, right? So this idea that um, it's kind of like a, a, a needle, like a vaccine that we're gonna like vaccinate Russians against the Putin propaganda with this by, by you know, signaling the, or sending those messages, um, I just don't think that it's uh, both, neither te technically feasible uh, or realistic or in terms of, I guess, human psychology or media psychology will, uh, will work in this way. And so as for mothers, uh, again, you mentioned interestingly that, you know, much has been made out of, but where? Here in Western media. If you watch, if you watch Russian, you know, mainstream media, you are not going to hear about it. Uh, you're, you know, uh, or it's going to be framed in a sense no, I mean, I'm going to correct myself. You're just not going to hear about it, period. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to think mm -hmm. of a single example of even a coverage of, you know, a dead son arriving and the grieving mother think, saying, you know, he died as a hero, Russian hero. No, you're just not going to hear about uh, any casualties or losses uh, uh, or any coverage of that period. So, so it is happening. Again, you're going to hear from the same um, alternative voices, alternative platforms that broadcast to the uh, to those who are already seeking it. And there, this is a subject of conversation for sure. Uh, but um, I'm not seeing this being reported or anything that actually is seen by millions, by, by, by most Russians. 
As a follow up to that, and instead of you know, framing the, the the mother's question as reporting in the media, but um, you know, as a mother myself, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. if you know my son were off fighting somewhere, I would you know do whatever I could take to figure out what was going on. And so, are there is there anything interesting happening in that space in terms of trying to you know figure out information, or or is there just you know trust in the government, trust in the fact that they'll get the information they need when they're supposed to get it. No, I'm sure, I'm sure. So I don't know for a fact, but I'm sure that, uh, so we've seen, for example, that, that the, the cruise members, uh, the, the crew, the crew of, of the Moskva, the down flagship of the Black Navy fleet, that some of them have, you know, quote unquote, gone missing uh, or official report is missing. And so, we, so I've seen reporting probably as, as you have of the parents and specifically this one particular father of a, of a soldier of a private who had gone missing kind of leading a, a social media campaign if you will uh, to find out what's happening with his son and so we see and probably will see increasingly a number of these um, individual um, isolated cases um, in, again in today's Russia even if they wanted to form let's say uh, an NGO or kind of a more of a network structure of uh, you know parents of soldiers fighting in Ukraine or those who were are gone missing, it, it's impossible to to imagine such uh, such kind of a network organization or, or let alone anything institutionalized of this uh, of the sort. So I, I'm afraid it's going to remain at a level of this kind of individual um, individualized cases, isolated cases. Great, Th thank you for that, um, Anna. Um, sticking on the military question a little bit, um, this questioner says most of uh, Russia's military soldiers come from impoverished ethnic minority regions, mm -hmm. um, and I just would want for you to comment on that. And then two, if, if indeed that is the case, what might some of the long-term impact be of the war, whether from high casualty rates or from a contracting economy, be on, um, be on those regions? Sure. I think uh, Russia's very unique specific type of authoritarianism, sort of the power vertical, uh, much discussed power vertical that Putin has built, the specific machinery that he built, meaning that he centralized power and personalized power, but also uh, uh, made sure that, that those structures work in parallel with the institutions of coercion and control. Regional levels of governments obviously are also important um, in that calculation, and he succeeded in uh, kind of keeping and aligning the ethnic groups uh, uh, into this, integrating them into the system. But at the same time, and this is not going to be an exhaustive answer to that very, very good question, but I do think that considering that um, uh, Russia, the Kremlin has been crushing uh, dissent, um, media, as Stanislav has been describing, has been nearly monopolized and there, is no, there are very, very few, if any, channel of opposition uh, available that puts, and I wonder what Tim thinks about this, that makes Russia in a way, while it is different in many respects, but it makes Russia a typical authoritarian state, similar to the some of the countries in the Arab region, mm -hmm. right? Before the Arab Spring, where everybody thought that um, Islam and democracy are incompatible, that oil is too big of a factor. And yet Arab Spring did happen partly because all of this intermediating institutions of discontent and opposition have been eliminated. So in such systems, whenever there is discontent, it comes in big waves. So going back to that question, um, the there is a social contract that between the people and the government that Putin has been able to keep his end of the bargain, largely because of the increase in oil prices, right? Um, Brian Taylor in his book, Code of Putinism, uh, refers to the lucky Vladimir, meaning that he benefited from the increase of oil prices, which allowed him to build this model. And Tim has been writing about this extensively. But I wonder, with the sanctions regime, which and if the Russian, uh, if the oil sector continues to be targeted, that is going to make it difficult to keep the social contract, which will include the ethnic minorities in various parts of Russia. And um, in general, Russian society, I'm generalizing definitely, is, uh, uh, is, is a lot more conservative and uh, religion probably plays a, the orthodox authoritarianism marriage the two uh, plays a role um, but 
under Putin, one of my respondents in Moscow pointed out that any revolutions in the public discourse have been equated to state collapse, which partly explains uh, Russian conservatism to coming out in protest and kind of stayed with me that quote that people might be afraid of coming out in large numbers because they have been fed this narrative that if you do the state will collapse um, in 1917 right so there's a history of that. Um, so I guess the answer I have is that no, I think ethnicity Soviet Union disintegrated and in that period ethnicity ethno federalism was a huge factor in the Soviet collapse was not the primary factor, but was a significant factor. So I would say that it is a wild card. I think the, the person who's asking the question is spot on to keep an eye on that, but I would argue that it should be as part of a broader politics of discontent, um, whether the social contract um, can be held. And in this respect, Russia, again, might be somewhat similar to other authoritarian societies. Thank you. That, that that was a fascinating question and equally fascinating answer. And it, and it kind of, in the middle, I was deciding what I should close with my final mm -hmm. question. So I'm actually going to leave it to Tim to decide because mm -hmm. I was <laughs> going to ask about um, NATO expansion, um, mm. just, to, just to end on a light note, um, because of Sweden and Finland are report, considering um, NATO application. Um, and Russia obviously is not going to perceive that as being favorable. And so how do you see Russia reacting? But I was intrigued by what Anna said, because we have gotten questions about succession in Russia, mm. which I feel like, you know, given given all that that you said about the, you know, kind of the, the hard structure and that maybe this this wouldn't happen, but it it could be worth um, you know, thinking about. Uh, and so your choice, NATO or succession? Oh, I'll leave it to you. Two really <laughs> tough ones. Uh, <laughs> let me take the latter only because I, I've written some about this and done more academic research on it. Um, typically in these personalist autocracies, when a, lose, when a, a leader loses power, uh, it's violent, it's unexpected, and it produces instability. So uh, about 70% of the time in these personalist autocracies in the post-war era, they lose power either through a coup or through a uh, mass revolt, through non-constitutional means. So there, and 80% of the time these leaders end up in exile, in jail, or dead. So if in one party autocracy, in, in one party states like China, uh, the leader can go back to the party or in the military led regimes, they can go back to the military. In these highly personalist regimes, there's no soft landing pad. Um, it's also because they destroyed so many of the institutions as Stanislav was talking about, all of the intermediate institutions and the media, um, it's difficult to, more difficult to build a, a kind of liberal open democracy uh, in the wake of a personalist autocracy than, af than after a, a one party or military led uh, autocracy. Um, and typically uh, about 10% of the time, if there's a coup, these personalist autocracies are followed by a, more, uh, uh, by a democracy. And if there's mass mobilization, about 40% of the time, uh, uh, personalist autocracies are replaced by a, uh, you know, hybrid regime or, or a democratic uh, a regime. So how the leader falls matters a lot for what um, uh, comes after. Now that said, you know, we haven't seen anything like the scale of opposition either among the elites or among the mass publics that would put, put Putin's position at risk. Uh, we need to rem remind ourselves that we're two months into this conflict uh, the sanctions are designed to work over many months, not immediately, um, and there will be a, a kind of slow grinding of the Russian economy. And um, should the military campaign continue to be costly, that would also be a big drag on um, Putin's ability to stay in power. But we're nowhere near a position yet where I think Putin's uh, time in office is seriously challenged. Thank you. Um, thank, thanks to each of you. I, I thought that this was a fascinating conversation and I feel like we could have gone like an hour with each of you on, on all of these different topics. Um, I really appreciate your joining us. I really appreciate everyone with the really fantastic questions. Um, 
if you want deeper dives, uh, Brian is putting in the chat um, information about some of the books and articles that you've all published. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I really, really, truly appreciate it um, and, and for coming today. Um, our next event is on Monday, May 2nd, and we're actually switching gears a little bit. We'll be talking about Tunisia. Um, so we'll have Lisa Anderson and uh, Kamel Jadidi. Um, so that is on Monday, May 2nd at noon. And Monday is next week, or um, as <laughs> some of you, it comes up fast. Um, and we do have an event for those in New York with uh, Fiona Hill, and that's on, the, on May, Wednesday, May 4th in the evening. Um, so we have a limited number of seats left for that. So please do RSVP. And, um, and I believe that is all. So thank you thank all you. for joining us today. I really thank appreciate you. it. Um, and, and take care, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.